Chapter twenty two of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter twenty two. The characteristic defects of Wordsworth's poetry, with the principles from which the judgment that they are defects is deduced. Their proportion to the beauties, for the greatest part characteristic of his theory only if mr wordsworth have set forth principles of poetry which his arguments are insufficient to support let him and those who have adopted his sentiments be set right by the confutation of those arguments and by the substitution of more philosophical principles and still let the due credit be given to the portion and importance of the truths which are blended with his theory truths the too exclusive attention to which had occasioned its errors by tempting him to carry those truths beyond their proper limits if his mistaken theory have at all influenced his poetic compositions let the effects be pointed out and the instances given but let it likewise be shown how far the influence has acted whether diffusively or only by starts whether the number and importance of the poems and passages thus infected be great or trifling compared with the sound portion and lastly whether they are inwoven into the texture of his works or are loose and separable the result of such a trial would evince beyond a doubt what it is high time to announce decisively and aloud that the supposed characteristics of mr wordsworth's poetry whether admired or reprobated whether their simplicity or simpleness faithful adherence to essential nature or wilful selections from human nature of its meanest forms and under the least attractive associations are as little the real characteristics of his poetry at large as of his genius and the constitution of his mind in a comparatively small number of poems he chose to try an experiment and this experiment we will suppose to have failed yet even in these poems it is impossible not to perceive that the natural tendency of the poet's mind is to great objects and elevated conceptions the poem entitled fidelity is for the greater part written in language as unraised and naked as any perhaps in the two volumes yet take the following stanza and compare it with the preceding stanzas of the same poem there sometimes doth a leaping fish send through the tarn a lonely cheer the crags repeat the raven's croak in symphony austere thither the rainbow comes the cloud and mist that spread the flying shroud and sunbeams and the sounding blast that if it could would hurry past but that enormous barrier holds it fast or compare the four last lines of the concluding stanza with the former half yes proof was plain that since the day on which the traveller thus had died the dog had watched about the spot or by his master's side how nourished here through such long time he knows who gave that love sublime and gave that strength of feeling great above all human estimate can any candid and intelligent mind hesitate in determining which of these best represents the tendency and native character of the poet's genius will he not decide that the one was written because the poet would so write and the other because he could not so entirely repress the force and grandeur of his mind but that he must in some part or other of every composition write otherwise in short that his only disease is the being out of his element like the swan that having amused himself for a while with crushing the weeds on the river's bank soon returns to his own majestic movements on its reflecting and sustaining surface let it be observed that i am here supposing the imagined judge to whom i appeal to have already decided against the poet's theory as far as it is different from the principles of the art generally acknowledged i cannot here enter into a detailed examination of mr wordsworth's works but i will attempt to give the main results of my own judgment after an acquaintance of many years and repeated perusals and though to appreciate the defects of a great mind it is necessary to understand previously its characteristic excellences yet i have already expressed myself with sufficient fulness to preclude most of the ill effects that might arise from my pursuing a contrary arrangement i will therefore commence with what i deem the prominent defects of his poems hitherto published the first characteristic though only occasional defect which i appear to myself to find in these poems is the inconstancy of the style under this name i refer to the sudden and unprepared transitions from lines or sentences of peculiar felicity at all events striking and original to a style not only unimpassioned but undistinguished he sinks too often and too abruptly to that style which i should place in the second division of language dividing it into the three species first that which is peculiar to poetry second that which is only proper in prose and third the neutral or common to both there have been works such as cowley's essay on cromwell in which prose and verse are intermixed not as in the consolation of boetius or the argenis of berkeley 
by the insertion of poems supposed to have been spoken or composed on occasions previously related in prose but the poet passing from one to the other as the nature of the thoughts or his own feelings dictated yet this mode of composition does not satisfy a cultivated taste there is something unpleasant in the being thus obliged to alternate states of feeling so dissimilar and this too in a species of writing the pleasure from which is in part derived from the preparation and previous expectation of the reader a portion of that awkwardness is felt which hangs upon the introduction of songs in our modern comic operas and to prevent which the judicious metastasia as to whose exquisite taste there can be no hesitation whatever doubts may be entertained as to his poetic genius uniformly place the aria at the end of the scene at the same time that he almost always raises and impassions the style of the recitative immediately preceding even in real life the difference is great and evident between words used as the arbitrary marks of thought our smooth market coin of intercourse with the image and superscription worn out by currency and those which convey pictures either borrowed from one outward object to enliven and particularize some other or used allegorically to body forth the inward state of the person speaking or such as are at least the exponents of his peculiar turn and unusual extent of faculty so much so indeed that in the social circles of private life we often find a striking use of the latter put a stop to the general flow of conversation and by the excitement arising from consented attention produce a sort of damp and interruption for some minutes after but in the perusal of works of literary art we prepare ourselves for such language and the business of the writer like that of a painter whose subject requires unusual splendour and prominence is so to raise the lower and neutral tints that what in a different style would be the commanding colours are here used as the means of that gentle degradation requisite in order to produce the effect of a whole where this is not achieved in a poem the metre merely reminds the reader of his claims in order to disappoint them and where this defect occurs frequently his feelings are alternately startled by anticlimax and hyperclimax i refer the reader to the exquisite stanza cited for another purpose from the blind highland boy and then annex as being in my opinion instances of this disharmony in style the two following and one the rarest was a shell which he poor child had studied well the shell of a green turtle thin and hollow you might sit therein it was so wide and deep our highland boy oft visited the house which held this prize and led by choice or chance did thither come one day when no one was at home and found the door unbarred or page a hundred and seventy two volume one tis gone forgotten let me do my best there was a smile or two i can remember them i see the smiles worth all the world to me dear baby i must lay thee down thou troublest me with strange alarms smiles hast thou sweet ones of thine own i cannot keep thee in my arms for they confound me as it is i have forgot those smiles of his or page two hundred and sixty nine volume one thou hast a nest for thy love and thy rest and though little troubled with sloth drunken lark thou wouldst be loath to be such a traveller as i happy happy liver with a soul as strong as a mountain river pouring out praise to the almighty giver joy and jollity be with us both hearing thee or else some other as merry a brother i on the earth will go plodding on by myself cheerfully till the day is done the incongruity which i appear to find in this passage is that of the two noble lines in italics with the preceding and following so volume two page thirty close by a pond upon the further side he stood alone a minute's space i guess i watched him he continuing motionless to the pool's further margin than i drew he being all the while before me full in view compare this with the repetition of the same image the next stanza but two and still as i drew near with gentle pace beside the little pond or moorish flood motionless as a clod the old man stood that heareth not the loud winds when they call and moveth altogether if it move at all or lastly the second of the three following stanzas compared both with the first and the third my former thoughts returned the fear that kills and hope that is unwilling to be fed cold pain and labour and all fleshly ills and mighty poets in their misery dead but now perplexed by what the old man had said my question eagerly did i renew how is it that you live and what is it you do he with a smile did then his words repeat and said that gathering leeches far and wide he travels stirring thus about his feet the waters of the ponds where they abide once i could meet with them on every side but they have dwindled long by slow decay yet still i persevere and find them where i may while he was talking thus the lonely place the old man's shape and speech all troubled me in my mind's eye i seemed to see him pace about the weary moors continually 
wandering about alone and silently indeed this fine poem is especially characteristic of the author there is scarce a defect or excellence in his writings of which it would not present a specimen but it would be unjust not to repeat that this defect is only occasional from a careful reperusal of the two volumes of poems i doubt whether the objectionable passages would amount in the whole to one hundred lines not the eighth part of the number of pages in the excursion the feeling of incongruity is seldom excited by the diction of any passage considered in itself but by the sudden superiority of some other passage forming the content the second defect i can generalize with tolerable accuracy if the reader will pardon an uncouth and new coined word there is i should say not seldom a matter of factness in certain poems this may be divided into first a laborious minuteness and fidelity in the representation of objects and their positions as they appeared to the poet himself secondly the insertion of accidental circumstances in order to the full explanation of his living characters their dispositions and actions which circumstances might be necessary to establish the probability of a statement in real life where nothing is taken for granted by the hearer but appears superfluous in poetry where the reader is willing to believe for his own sake to this accidentality i object as contravening the essence of poetry which aristotle pronounces to be swidiotaton kai philosophotaton genos the most intense weighty and philosophical product of human art adding as the reason that it is the most catholic and abstract the following passage from davenant's prefatory letter to hobbes well expresses this truth when i considered the actions which i meant to describe those inferring the persons i was again persuaded rather to choose those of a former age than the present and in a century so far removed as might preserve me from their improper examinations who know not the requisites of a poem nor how much pleasure they lose and even the pleasure of heroic poesy are not unprofitable who take away the liberty of a poet and fetter his feet in the shackles of an historian for why should a poet doubt in story to mend the intrigues of fortune by more delightful conveyances of probable fictions because austere historians have entered into bond to truth an obligation which were in poets as foolish and unnecessary as is the bondage of false martyrs who lie in chains for a mistaken opinion but by this i would imply that truth narrative and past is the idol of historians who worship a dead thing and truth operative and by effects continually alive is the mistress of poets who hath not her existence in matter but in reason for this minute accuracy in the painting of local imagery the lines in the excursion pages ninety six ninety seven and ninety eight may be taken if not as a striking instance yet as an illustration of my meaning it must be some strong motive as for instance that the description was necessary to the intelligibility of the tale which could induce me to describe in a number of verses what a draughtsman could present to the eye with incomparably greater satisfaction by half a dozen strokes of his pencil or the painter with as many touches of his brush such descriptions too often occasion in the mind of a reader who is determined to understand his author a feeling of labour not very dissimilar to that with which he would construct a diagram line by line for a long geometrical proposition it seems to be like taking the pieces of a dissected map out of its box we first look at one part and then at another then join and dovetail them and when the successive acts of attention have been completed there is a retrogressive effort of mind to behold it as a whole the poet should paint to the imagination not to the fancy and i know no happier case to exemplify the distinction between these two faculties masterpieces of the former mode of poetic painting abound in the writings of milton for example the fig tree not that kind for fruit renowned but such as at this day to indians known in malabar or deccan spreads her arms branching so broad and long that in the ground the bended twigs take root and daughters grow about the mother tree a pillared shade high overarched and echoing walks between there off the indian herdsman shunning heat shelters in cool and tends his pasturing herds at hoop-holes cut through thickest shade this is creation rather than painting or if painting yet such and with such co-presence of the whole picture flashed at once upon the eye as the sun paints in a camera obscura but the poet must likewise understand and command what bacon calls the vestigia communia of the senses the latency of all in each and more especially as by a magical penny duplex the excitement of vision by sound and the exponents of sound thus the echoing walks between may be almost said to reverse the fable in tradition of the head of memnon in the egyptian statue such may be deservedly entitled the creative words in the world of imagination the second division respects an apparent minute adherence to matter of fact in character and incidents a biographical attention to probability and an anxiety of explanation and retrospect under this head i shall deliver with no feigned diffidence 
the results of my best reflection on the great point of controversy between mr wordsworth and his objectors namely on the choice of his characters i have already declared and i trust justified my utter dissent from the mode of argument which his critics have hitherto employed to their question why did you choose such a character or a character from such a rank of life the poet might in my opinion fairly retort why with the conception of my character did you make wilful choice of mean or ludicrous associations not furnished by me but supplied from your own sickly and fastidious feelings how was it indeed probable that such arguments could have any weight with an author whose plan whose guiding principle and main object it was to attack and subdue that state of association which leads us to place the chief value on those things on which man differs from man and to forget or disregard the high dignities which belong to human nature the sense and the feeling which may be and ought to be found in all ranks the feelings with which as christians we contemplate a mixed congregation rising or kneeling before their common maker mr wordsworth would have us entertain at all times as men and as readers and by the excitement of this lofty yet prideless impartiality in poetry he might hope to have encouraged its continuance in real life the praise of good men be his in real life and i trust even in my imagination i honour a virtuous and wise man without reference to the presence or absence of artificial advantages whether in the person of an armed baron a laurelled bard or of an old peddler or still older leech-gatherer the same qualities of head and heart must claim the same reverence and even in poetry i am not conscious that i have ever suffered my feelings to be disturbed or offended by any thoughts or images which the poet himself has not presented but yet i object nevertheless and for the following reasons first because the object in view as an immediate object belongs to the moral philosopher and would be pursued not only more appropriately but in my opinion with far greater probability of success in sermons or moral essays than in an elevated poem it seems indeed to destroy the main fundamental distinction not only between a poem and prose but even between philosophy and works of fiction inasmuch as it proposes truth for its immediate object instead of pleasure now till the blessed time shall come when truth itself shall be pleasure and both shall be so united as to be distinguishable in words only not in feeling it will remain the poet's office to proceed upon that state of association which actually exists as general instead of attempting first to make it what it ought to be and then to let the pleasure follow but here is unfortunately a small hysteron proteron for the communication of pleasure is the introductory means by which alone the poet must expect to moralize his readers secondly though i were to admit for a moment this argument to be groundless yet how is the moral effect to be produced by merely attaching the name of some low profession to powers which are least likely and to qualities which are assuredly not more likely to be found in it the poet speaking in his own person may at once delight and improve us by sentiments which teach us the independence of goodness of wisdom and even of genius on the favours of fortune and having made a due reverence before the throne of antonine he may bow with equal awe before epictetus among his fellow-slaves and rejoice in the plain presence of his dignity who is not at once delighted and improved when the poet wordsworth himself exclaims o oh, many are the poets that are sown by nature men endowed with highest gifts the vision and the faculty divine yet wanting the accomplishment of verse nor having e'er as life advanced been led by circumstance to take unto the height the measure of themselves these favoured beings all but a scattered few live out their time husbanding that which they possess within and go to the grave unthought of strongest minds are often those of whom the noisy world hears least to use a colloquial phrase such sentiments in such language do one's heart good though i for my part have not the fullest faith in the truth of the observation on the contrary i believe the instances to be exceedingly rare and should feel almost as strong an objection to introduce such a character in a poetic fiction as a pair of black swans on a lake in a fancy landscape when i think how many and how much better books than homer or even than herodotus pindar or aeschylus could have read are in the power of almost every man in a country where almost every man is instructed to read and write and how restless how difficultly hidden the powers of genius are and yet find even in situations the most favourable according to mr wordsworth for the formation of a pure and poetic language in situations which ensure familiarity with the grandest objects of the imagination but one burns among the shepherds of scotland and not a single poet of humble life among those of english lakes and mountains i conclude that poetic genius is not only a very delicate but a very rare plant but be this as it may the feelings with which i think of chatterton the marvellous boy the sleepless soul that perished in his pride of burns who walked in glory and in joy behind his plough upon the mountain-side 
are widely different from those with which i should read a poem where the author having occasion for the character of a poet and a philosopher in the fable of his narration had chosen to make him a chimney-sweeper and then in order to remove all doubts on the subject had invented an account of his birth parentage and education with all the strange and fortunate accidents which had concurred in making him at once poet philosopher and sweep nothing but biography can justify this if it be admissible even in a novel it must be one in the manner of defoe's that were meant to pass for histories not in the manner of fielding's in the life of moll flanders or colonel jack not in a tom jones or even a joseph andrews much less then can it be legitimately introduced in a poem the characters of which amid the strongest individualization must still remain representative the precepts of horace on this point are grounded on the nature both of poetry and of the human mind they are not more peremptory than wise and prudent for in the first place a deviation from them perplexes the reader's feelings and all the circumstances which are feigned in order to make such accidents less improbable divide and disquiet his faith rather than aid and support it spite of all attempts the fiction will appear and unfortunately not as fictitious but as false the reader not only knows that the sentiments and language are the poet's own and his own too in his artificial character as poet but by the fruitless endeavours to make him think the contrary he is not even suffered to forget it the effect is similar to that produced by an epic poet when the fable and the characters are derived from scripture history as in the messiah of klopstock or in cumberland's calvary and not merely suggested by it as in the paradise lost of milton that illusion contradistinguished from delusion that negative faith which simply permits the images presented to work by their own force without either denial or affirmation of their real existence by the judgment is rendered impossible by their immediate neighbourhood to words and facts of known and absolute truth a faith which transcends even historic belief must absolutely put out this mere poetic analogon of faith as the summer sun is said to extinguish our household fires when it shines full upon them what would otherwise have been yielded to as pleasing fiction is repelled as revolting falsehood the effect produced in this latter case by the solemn belief of the reader is in a less degree brought about in the instances to which i have been objecting by the balked attempts of the author to make him believe add to all the foregoing the seeming uselessness both of the project and of the anecdotes from which it is to derive support is there one word for instance attributed to the peddler in the excursion characteristic of a peddler one sentiment that might not more plausibly even without the aid of any previous explanation have proceeded from any wise and beneficent old man of a rank or profession in which the language of learning and refinement are natural and to be expected need the rank have been at all particularized where nothing follows which the knowledge of that rank is to explain or illustrate when on the contrary this information renders the man's language feeling sentiments and information a riddle which must itself be solved by episodes of anecdote finally when this and this alone could have induced a genuine poet to imweave in a poem of the loftiest style and on subjects the loftiest and of the most universal interest such minute matters of fact not unlike those furnished for the obituary of a magazine by the friends of some obscure ornament of society lately deceased in some obscure town as among the hills of athol he was born there on a small hereditary farm an unproductive slip of rugged ground his father dwelt and died in poverty while he whose lowly fortune i retrace the youngest of three sons was yet a babe a little one unconscious of their loss but ere he had outgrown his infant days his widowed mother for a second mate espoused the teacher of the village school who on her offspring zealously bestowed needful instruction from his sixth year the boy of whom i speak in summer tended cattle on the hills but through the inclement and the perilous days of long continuing winter he repaired to his stepfather's school etc for all the admirable passages interposed in this narration might with trifling alterations have been far more appropriately and with far greater verisimilitude told of a poet in the character of a poet and without incurring another defect which i shall now mention and a sufficient illustration of which will have been here anticipated third an undue predilection for the dramatic form in certain poems from which one or other of two evils result either the thoughts and diction are different from that of the poet and then there arises an incongruity of style or they are the same and indistinguishable and then it presents a species of ventriloquism where two are represented as talking while in truth one man only speaks the fourth class of defects is closely connected with the former but yet are such as arise likewise from an intensity of feeling disproportionate to such knowledge and value of the objects described as can be fairly anticipated of men in general even of the most cultivated classes and with which therefore few only and those few particularly circumstanced can be supposed to sympathize 
in this class i comprise occasional prolixity repetition and an eddying instead of progression of thought as instances see pages twenty seven twenty eight and sixty two of the poems volume one and the first eighty lines of the sixth book of the excursion fifth and last thoughts and images too great for the subject this is an approximation to what might be called mental bombast as distinguished from verbal for as in the latter there is a disproportion of the expressions to the thoughts so in this there is a disproportion of thought to the circumstance and occasion this by the by is a fault of which none but a man of genius is capable it is the awkwardness and strength of hercules with the distaff of omphala it is a well-known fact that bright colours in motion both make and leave the strongest impressions on the eye nothing is more likely too than that a vivid image or visual spectrum thus originated may become the link of association in recalling the feelings and images that had accompanied the original impression but if we describe this in such lines as they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude in what words shall we describe the joy of retrospection when the images and virtuous actions of a whole well-spent life pass before that conscience which is indeed the inward eye which is indeed the bliss of solitude assuredly we seem to sink most abruptly not to say burlesquely and almost as in a medley from this couplet to and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils volume one page three hundred and twenty eight the second instance is from volume two page twelve where the poet having gone out for a day's tour of pleasure meets early in the morning with a knot of gypsies who had pitched their blanket tents and straw beds together with their children and asses in some field by the roadside at the close of the day on his return our tourists found them in the same place twelve hours says he twelve hours twelve bounteous hours are gone while i have been a traveller under open sky much witnessing of change and cheer yet as i left i find them here whereat the poet without seeming to reflect that the poor tawny wanderers might probably have been tramping for weeks together through road and lane over moor and mountain and consequently must have been right glad to rest themselves their children and cattle for one whole day and overlooking the obvious truth that such repose might be quite as necessary for them as a walk of the same continuance was pleasing or healthful for the more fortunate poet expresses his indignation in a series of lines the diction and imagery of which would have been rather above than below the mark had they been applied to the immense empire of china in progressive for thirty centuries the weary sun betook himself to rest then issued vesper from the fulgent west outshining like a visible god the glorious path in which he trod and now ascending after one dark hour and one night's diminution of her power behold the mighty moon this way she looks as if at them but they regard not her o oh, better wrong and strife better vain deeds or evil than such life the silent heavens have goings on the stars have tasks but these have none the last instance of this defect for i know no other than these already cited is from the ode page three hundred and fifty one volume two where speaking of a child a six years darling of a pygmy size he thus addresses him thou best philosopher who yet does keep thy heritage thou eye among the blind that deaf and silent reads the eternal deep haunted for ever by the eternal mind mighty prophet seer blessed on whom those truths do rest which we are toiling all our lives to find thou over whom thy immortality broods like the day a master or a slave a present which is not to be put by now here not to stop at the daring spirit of metaphor which connects the epithets deaf and silent with the apostrophized eye or if we are to refer it to the preceding word philosopher the faulty and equivocal syntax of the passage and without examining the propriety of making a master brood o'er a slave or the day brood at all we will merely ask what does all this mean in what sense is a child of that age a philosopher in what sense does he read the eternal deep in what sense is he declared to be for ever haunted by the supreme being or so inspired as to deserve the splendid titles of a mighty prophet a blessed seer by reflection by knowledge by conscious intuition or by any form or modification of consciousness these would be tidings indeed but such as would presuppose an immediate revelation to the inspired communicator and require miracles to authenticate his inspiration children at this age give us no such information of themselves and at what time were we dipped in the lethe which has produced such utter oblivion of a state so godlike there are many of us that still possess some remembrances more or less distinct respecting themselves at six years old pity that the worthless straws only should float while treasures compared with which all the mines of golconda and mexico were but straws should be absorbed by some unknown gulf into some unknown abyss but if this be too wild and exorbitant to be suspected as having been the poet's meaning if these mysterious gifts faculties and operations are not accompanied with consciousness who else is conscious of them 
or how can it be called the child if it be no part of the child's conscious being for what i know the thinking spirit within me may be substantially one with the principle of life and of vital operation for what i know it might be employed as a secondary agent in the marvellous organization and organic movements of my body but surely it would be strange language to say that i construct my heart or that i propel the finer influences through my nerves or that i compress my brain and draw the curtains of sleep round my own eyes spinoza and bayman were on different systems both pantheists and among the ancients there were philosophers teachers of the en kai pan who not only taught that god was all but that this all constituted god yet not even these would confound the part as a part with the whole as the whole nay in no system is the distinction between the individual and god between the modification and the one only substance more sharply drawn than in that of spinoza jacobi indeed relates of lessing that after a conversation with him at the house of the poet gleim the tetes and anacreon of the german parnassus in which conversation lessing had avowed privately to jacobi his reluctance to admit any personal existence of the supreme being or the possibility of personality except in a finite intellect and while they were sitting at table a shower of rain came on unexpectedly gleim expressed his regret at the circumstance because they had meant to drink their wine in the garden upon which lessing in one of his half earnest half joking moods nodded to jacobi and said it is i perhaps that am doing that i e raining and jacobi answered or perhaps i gleim contented himself with staring at them both without asking for any explanation so with regard to this passage in what sense can the magnificent attributes above quoted be appropriated to a child which would not make them equally suitable to a bee or a dog or a field of corn or even to a ship or the wind and waves that propel it the omnipresent spirit works equally in them as in the child and the child is equally unconscious of it as they it cannot surely be that the four lines immediately following are to contain the explanation to whom the grave is but a lonely bed without the sense or sight of day or the warm light a place of thought where we in waiting lie surely it cannot be that this wonder rousing apostrophe is but a comment on the little poem we are seven that the whole meaning of the passage is reducible to the assertion that a child who by the by at six years old would have been better instructed in most christian families has no other notion of death than that of lying in a dark cold place and still i hope not as in a place of thought not the frightful notion of lying awake in his grave the analogy between death and sleep is too simple too natural to render so horrid a belief possible for children even had they not been in the habit as all christian children are of hearing the latter term used to express the former but if the child's belief be only that he is not dead but sleepeth wherein does it differ from that of his father and mother or any other adult and instructed person to form an idea of a thing's becoming nothing or if nothing becoming a thing it is impossible to all finite beings alike of whatever age and however educated or uneducated thus it is with splendid paradoxes in general if the words are taken in the common sense they convey an absurdity and if in contempt of dictionaries and custom they are so interpreted as to avoid the absurdity the meaning dwindles into some bold truism thus you must at once understand the words contrary to their common import in order to arrive at any sense and according to their common import if you are to receive from them any feeling of sublimity or admiration though the instances of this defect in mr wordsworth's poems are so few that for themselves it would have been scarcely just to attract the reader's attention toward them yet i have dwelt on it and perhaps the more for this very reason for being so very few they cannot sensibly detract from the reputation of an author who is even characterized by the number of profound truths in his writings which will stand the severest analysis and yet few as they are they are exactly those passages which his blind admirers would be most likely and best able to imitate but wordsworth where he is indeed wordsworth may be mimicked by copyists he may be plundered by plagiarists but he cannot be imitated except by those who are not born to be imitators for without his depth of feeling and his imaginative power his sense would want its vital warmth and peculiarity and without his strong sense his mysticism would become sickly mere fog and dimness to these defects which as appears by the extracts are only occasional i may oppose with far less fear of encountering the descent of any candid and intelligent reader the following for the most part correspondent excellences first an austere purity of language both grammatically and logically in short a perfect appropriateness of the words to the meaning of how high value i deem this and how particularly estimable i hold the example at the present day has been already stated and in part too the reasons on which i ground both the moral and intellectual importance of habituating ourselves to a strict accuracy of expression it is noticeable how limited an acquaintance with the masterpieces of art will suffice to form a correct and even a sensitive taste where none but masterpieces have been seen and admired 
while on the other hand the most correct notions and the widest acquaintance with the words of excellence of all ages and countries will not perfectly secure us against the contagious familiarity with the far more numerous offspring of tastelessness or of a perverted taste if this be the case as it notoriously is with the arts of music and painting much more difficult will it be to avoid the infection of multiplied and daily examples in the practice of an art which uses words and words only as its instruments in poetry in which every line every phrase may pass the ordeal of deliberation and deliberate choice it is possible and barely possible to attain that ultimatum which i have ventured to propose as the infallible test of a blameless style namely its untranslatableness in words of the same language without injury to the meaning be it observed however that i include in the meaning of a word not only its correspondent object but likewise all the associations which it recalls for language is framed to convey not the object alone but likewise the character mood and intentions of the person who is representing it in poetry it is practicable to preserve the diction uncorrupted by the affectations and misappropriations which promiscuous authorship and reading not promiscuous only because it is disproportionally most conversant with the compositions of the day have rendered general yet even to the poet composing in his own province it is an arduous work and as the result and pledge of a watchful good sense of fine and luminous distinction and of complete self-possession may justly claim all the honour which belongs to an attainment equally difficult and valuable and the more valuable for being rare it is at all times the proper food of the understanding but in an age of corrupt eloquence it is both food and antidote in prose i doubt whether it be even possible to preserve our style wholly unalloyed by the vicious phraseology which meets us everywhere from the sermon to the newspaper from the harangue of the legislator to the speech from the convivial chair announcing a toast or sentiment our chains rattle even while we are complaining of them the poems of boetius rise high in our estimation when we compare them with those of his contemporaries as sidonius apollinaris and others they might even be referred to a purer age but that the prose in which they are set as jewels in a crown of lead or iron betrays the true age of the writer much however may be effected by education i believe not only from grounds of reason but from having in great measure assured myself of the fact by actual though limited experience that to a youth led from his first boyhood to investigate the meaning of every word and the reason of its choice and position logic presents itself as an old acquaintance under new names on some future occasion more especially demanding such disquisition i shall attempt to prove the close connection between veracity and habits of mental accuracy the beneficial after-effects of verbal precision in the preclusion of fanaticism which masters the feelings more especially by indistinct watchwords and to display the advantages which language alone at least which language with incomparably greater ease and certainty than any other means presents to the instructor of impressing modes of intellectual energy so constantly so imperceptibly and as it were by such elements and atoms as to secure in due time the formation of a second nature when we reflect that the cultivation of the judgment is a positive command of the moral law since the reason can give the principle alone and the conscience bears witness only to the motive while the application and effects must depend on the judgment when we consider that the greater part of our success and comfort in life depends on distinguishing the similar from the same that which is peculiar in each thing from that which it has in common with others so as still to select the most probable instead of the merely possible or positively unfit we shall learn to value earnestly and with a practical seriousness a mean already prepared for us by nature and society of teaching the young mind to think well and wisely by the same unremembered process and with the same never forgotten results as those by which it is taught to speak and converse now how much warmer the interest is how much more genial the feelings of reality and practicability and thence how much stronger the impulses to imitation are which a contemporary writer and especially a contemporary poet excites in youth and commencing manhood has been treated of in the earlier pages of these sketches i have only to add that all the praise which is due to the exertion of such influence for a purpose so important joined with that which must be claimed for the infrequency of the same excellence in the same perfection belongs in full right to mr wordsworth i am far however from denying that we have poets whose general style possesses the same excellence as mr moore lord byron mr bowles and in all his later and more important works our laurel honouring laureate but there are none in whose works i do not appear to myself to find more exceptions than in those of wordsworth quotations or specimens would here be wholly out of place and must be left for the critic who doubts and would invalidate the justice of this eulogy so applied the second characteristic excellence of mr wordsworth's work is a correspondent weight and sanity of the thoughts and sentiments one not from books but from the poet's own meditative observation they are fresh and have the dew upon them 
his muse at least when in her strength of wing and when she hovers aloft in her proper element makes audible a linked lay of truth of truth profound a sweet continuous lay not learnt but native her own natural notes even throughout his smaller poems there is scarcely one which is not rendered valuable by some just and original reflection c h twenty five volume two or the two following passages in one of his humblest compositions o reader had you in your mind such stores a silent thought can bring o gentle reader you would find a tale in everything and i have heard of hearts unkind kind deeds with coldness still returning alas the gratitude of men has oftener left me mourning or in a still higher strain the six beautiful quatrains page hundred and thirty four thus fares it still in our decay and yet the wiser mind mourns less for what age takes away than what it leaves behind the blackbird in the summer trees the lark upon the hill let loose their carols when they please are quiet when they will with nature never do they wage a foolish strife they see a happy youth and their old age is beautiful and free but we are pressed by heavy laws and often glad no more we wear a face of joy because we have been glad of yore if there is one who need bemoan his kindred laid in earth the household hearts that were his own it is the man of mirth my days my friend are almost gone my life has been approved and many love me but by none am i enough beloved or the sonnet on bonaparte page two hundred and two volume two or finally for a volume would scarce suffice to exhaust the instances the last stanza of the poem on the withered celandine volume two page three hundred and twelve to be a prodigal's favourite then worse truth a miser's pensioner behold our lot o man that from thy fair and shining youth age might but take the things youth needed not both in respect of this and of the former excellence mr wordsworth strikingly resembles samuel daniel one of the golden writers of our golden elizabethan age now most causelessly neglected samuel daniel whose diction bears no mark of time no distinction of age which has been and as long as our language shall last will be so far the language of the to-day and for ever as that it is more intelligible to us than the transitory fashions of our own particular age a similar praise is due to his sentiments no frequency of perusal can deprive them of their freshness for though they are brought into the full daylight of every reader's comprehension yet are they drawn up from depths which few in any age are privileged to visit into which few in any age have courage or inclination to descend if mr wordsworth is not equally with daniel alike intelligible to all readers of average understanding in all passages of his works the comparative difficulty does not arise from the greater impurity of the ore but from the nature and uses of the metal a poem is not necessarily obscure because it does not aim to be popular it is enough if a work be perspicuous to those for whom it is written and fit audience find though few to the ode on the intimations of immortality from recollections of early childhood the poet might have prefixed the lines which dante addresses to one of his own canzoni canzone i credo che saranno radi color che tua ragione intendan bene tanto lo sei faticoso ed alto o lyric song there will be few i think who may thy import understand aright thou art for them so arduous and so high but the ode was intended for such readers only as had been accustomed to watch the flux and reflux of their inmost nature to venture at times into the twilight realms of consciousness and to feel a deep interest in modes of inmost being to which they know that the attributes of time and space are inapplicable and alien but which yet cannot be conveyed save in symbols of time and space for such readers the sense is sufficiently plain and they will be as little disposed to charge mr wordsworth with believing the platonic pre-existence in the ordinary interpretation of the words as i am to believe that plato himself ever meant or taught it pola oi ut ancunos nocea bellae and don enti pharetras fonanta sintoisin es deto pan hermaenon chatisei sophos o pola edos fua mathontes de labroi panglossia coraces os acranta gareton dios pros on nicha theon third and wherein he soars far above daniel the sinewy strength and originality of single lines and paragraphs the frequent curiosa felicitas of his diction of which i need not here give specimens having anticipated them in a preceding page this beauty and as eminently characteristic of wordsworth's poetry his rudest assailants have felt themselves compelled to acknowledge and admire fourth the perfect truth of nature in his images and descriptions as taken immediately from nature and proving a long and genial intimacy with the very spirit which gives the physiognomic expression to all the works of nature like a green field reflected in a calm and perfectly transparent lake the image is distinguished from the reality only by its greater softness and lustre like the moisture or the polish on a pebble 
genius neither distorts nor false colours its objects but on the contrary brings out many a vein and many a tint which escape the eye of common observation thus raising to the rank of gems what had been often kicked away by the hurrying foot of the traveller on the dusty high road of custom let me refer to the whole description of skating volume one page forty two to forty seven especially to the lines so through the darkness and the cold we flew and not a voice was idle with the din meanwhile the precipices rang aloud the leafless trees in every icy crag tinkled like iron while the distant hills into the tumult sent an alien sound of melancholy not unnoticed while the stars eastward were sparkling clear and in the west the orange sky of evening died away or to the poem on the green linnet volume one page two hundred and forty four what can be more accurate yet more lovely than the two concluding stanzas upon yon tuft of hazel trees that twinkle to the gusty breeze behold him perched in ecstasies yet seeming still to hover there where the flutter of his wings upon his back and body flings shadows and sunny glimmerings that cover him all over while thus before my eyes he gleams a brother of the leaves he seems when in a moment forth he teems his little song in gushes as if it pleased him to disdain and mock the form which he did feign while he was dancing with the train of leaves among the bushes or the description of the blue cap and of the noontide silence page two hundred and eighty four or the poem to the cuckoo page two hundred and ninety nine or lastly though i might multiply the references to ten times the number to the poem so completely wordsworth's commencing three years she grew in sun and shower fifth a meditative pathos a union of deep and subtle thought with sensibility a sympathy with man as man the sympathy indeed of a contemplator rather than a fellow sufferer or co-mate spectator out particeps but of a contemplator from whose view no difference of rank conceals the sameness of the nature no injuries of wind or weather or toil or even of ignorance wholly disguise the human face divine the superscription and the image of the creator still remain legible to him under the dark lines with which guilt or calamity had cancelled or cross-barred it here the man and the poet lose and find themselves in each other the one as glorified the latter as substantiated in this mild and philosophic pathos wordsworth appears to me without a compeer such as he is so he writes see volume one page hundred and thirty four to hundred and thirty six or that most affecting composition the affliction of margaret of page hundred and sixty five to hundred and sixty eight which no mother and if i may judge by my own experience no parent can read without a tear or turn to that genuine lyric in the former edition entitled the mad mother page hundred and seventy four to hundred and seventy eight of which i cannot refrain from quoting two of the stanzas both of them for their pathos and the former for the fine transition in the two concluding lines of the stanza so expressive of that deranged state in which from the increased sensibility the sufferer's attention is abruptly drawn off by every trifle and in the same instant plucked back again by the one despotic thought bringing home with it by the blending fusing power of imagination and passion the alien object to which it had been so abruptly diverted no longer an alien but an ally and an inmate suck little babe oh suck again it cools my blood it cools my brain thy lips i feel them baby they draw from my heart the pain away oh press me with thy little hand it loosens something at my chest about that tight and deadly band i feel thy little fingers pressed the breeze i see is in the tree it comes to cool my babe and me thy father cares not for my breast tis thine sweet baby there to rest tis all thine own and if its hue be change that was so fair to view tis fair enough for thee my dove my beauty little child is flown but thou wilt live with me in love and what if my poor cheek be brown tis well for me thou canst not see how pale and wan it else would be last and pre-eminently i challenge for this poet the gift of imagination in the highest and strictest sense of the word in the play of fancy wordsworth to my feelings is not always graceful and sometimes recondite the likeness is occasionally too strange or demands too peculiar a point of view or is such as appears the creature of predetermined research rather than spontaneous presentation indeed his fancy seldom displays itself as mere and unmodified fancy but in imaginative power he stands nearest of all modern writers to shakespeare and milton and yet in a kind perfectly unborrowed and his own to employ his own words which are at once an instance and an illustration he does indeed to all thoughts and to all objects add the gleam the light that never was on sea or land the consecration and the poet's dream i shall select a few examples as most obviously manifesting this faculty but if i should ever be fortunate enough to render my analysis of imagination its origin and characters thoroughly intelligible to the reader 
he will scarcely open on a page of this poet's works without recognising more or less the presence and the influences of this faculty from the poem on the yew trees volume one page three hundred and three three hundred and four but worthier still of note are those fraternal four of borrowdale joined in one solemn and capacious grove huge trunks and each particular trunk a growth of intertwisted fibrous serpentine upcoiling and inveterately convolved not uninformed with fantasy and looks that threaten the profane a pillared shade upon whose grassless floor of red-brown hue by sheddings from the pinal umbrage tinged perennially beneath whose sable roof of boughs as if of festal purpose decked with unrejoicing berries ghostly shapes may meet up noontide fear and trembling hope silence and foresight death the skeleton and time the shadow there to celebrate as in a natural temple scattered o'er with altars undisturbed of mossy stone united worship or in mute repose to lie and listen to the mountain flood murmuring from glasamara's inmost caves the effect of the old man's figure in the poem of resolution and independence volume two page thirty three while he was talking thus the lonely place the old man's shape and speech all troubled me in my mind's eye i seemed to see him pace about the weary moors continually wandering about alone and silently or the eighth ninth nineteenth twenty sixth thirty first and thirty third in the collection of miscellaneous sonnets the sonnet on the subjugation of switzerland page two hundred and ten or the last ode from which i especially select the two following stanzas or paragraphs page three hundred and forty nine to three hundred and fifty our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting the soul that rises with us our life's star hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness but trailing clouds of glory do we come from god who is our home heaven lies about us in our infancy shades of the prison-house begin to close upon the growing boy but he beholds the light and whence it flows he sees it in his joy the youth who daily further from the east must travel still is nature's priest and by the vision splendid is on his way attended at length the man perceives it die away and fade into the light of common day and page three hundred and fifty two to three hundred and fifty four of the same ode o oh joy that in our embers is something that doth live that nature yet remembers what was so fugitive the thought of our past years in me doth breed perpetual benedictions not indeed for that which is most worthy to be blessed delight and liberty the simple creed of childhood whether busy or at rest with new-fledged hopes still fluttering in his breast not for these i raise the song of thanks and praise but for those obstinate questionings of sense and outward things fallings from us vanishings blank misgivings of a creature moving about in worlds not realised high instincts before which our mortal nature did tremble like a guilty thing surprised but for those first affections those shadowy recollections which be they what they may are yet the fountain light of all our day and yet a master light of all our seeing uphold us cherish and have power to make our noisy years seem moments in the being of the eternal silence truth that wake to perish never which neither listlessness nor mad endeavour nor man nor boy nor all that is at enmity with joy can utterly abolish or destroy hence in a season of calm weather though inland far we be our souls have sight of that immortal sea which brought us hither can in a moment travel thither and see the children sport upon the shore and hear the mighty waters rolling evermore and since it would be unfair to conclude with an extract which though highly characteristic must yet from the nature of the thoughts and the subject be interesting or perhaps intelligible to but a limited number of readers i will add from the poet's last published work a passage equally wordsworthian of the beauty of which and of the imaginative power displayed therein there can be but one opinion and one feeling see white doe page five fast the churchyard fills anon look again and they all are gone the cluster round the porch and the folk who sat in the shade of the prior's oak and scarcely had they disappeared ere the prelusive hymn is heard with one consent the people rejoice filling the church with a lofty voice they sing a service which they feel for tis the sunrise now of zeal and faith and hope are in their prime in great eliza's golden time a moment ends the fervent din and all is hushed without and within for though the priest more tranquilly recites the holy liturgy the only voice which you can hear is the river murmuring near when soft the dusky trees between and down the path through the open green where is no living thing to be seen and through yon gateway where is found beneath the arch with ivy bound free entrance to the churchyard ground and right across the verdant sod towards the very house of god comes gliding in with lovely gleam comes gliding in serene and slow soft and silent as a dream a solitary doe white she is as lily of june 
and beauteous as the silver moon when out of sight the clouds are driven and she's left alone in heaven or like a ship some gentle day in sunshine sailing far away a glittering ship that hath the plain of ocean for her own domain what harmonious pensive changes wait upon her as she ranges round and through this pile of state overthrown and desolate now a step or two her way is through space of open day where the enamoured sunny light brightens her that was so bright now doth a delicate shadow fall falls upon her like a breath from some lofty arch or wall as she passes underneath the following analogy will i am apprehensive appear dim and fantastic but in reading bartram's travels i could not help transcribing the following lines as a sort of allegory or connected simile and metaphor of wordsworth's intellect and genius the soil is a deep rich dark mould on a deep stratum of tenacious clay and that on a foundation of rocks which often break through both strata lifting their backs above the surface the trees which chiefly grow here are the gigantic black oak magnolia grandiflora fraximus excelsior platane and a few stately tulip trees what mr wordsworth will produce it is not for me to prophesy but i could pronounce with the liveliest convictions what he is capable of producing it is the first genuine philosophic poem the preceding criticism will not i am aware avail to overcome the prejudices of those who have made it a business to attack and ridicule mr wordsworth's compositions truth and prudence might be imagined as concentric circles the poet may perhaps have passed beyond the latter but he has confined himself far within the bounds of the former in designating these critics as too petulant to be passive to a genuine poet and too feeble to grapple with him men of palsied imaginations in whose minds all healthy action is languid who therefore feed as the many direct them or with the many are greedy after vicious provocatives so much for the detractors from wordsworth's merits on the other hand much as i might wish for their fuller sympathy i dare not flatter myself that the freedom with which i have declared my opinions concerning both his theory and his defects most of which are more or less connected with his theory either as cause or effect will be satisfactory or pleasing to all the poets admirers and advocates more indiscriminate than mine the admiration may be deeper and more sincere it cannot be but i have advanced no opinion either for praise or censure other than as text introductory to the reasons which compel me to form it above all i was fully convinced that such a criticism was not only wanted but that if executed with adequate ability it must conduce in no mean degree to mr wordsworth's reputation his fame belongs to another age and can neither be accelerated nor retarded how small the proportion of the defects are to the beauties i have repeatedly declared and that no one of them originates in deficiency of poetic genius had they been more and greater i should still as a friend to his literary character in the present age consider an analytic display of them as pure gain if only it removed as surely to all reflecting minds even the foregoing analysis must have removed the strange mistakes so slightly grounded yet so widely and industriously propagated of mr wordsworth's turn for simplicity i am not half as much irritated by hearing his enemies abuse him for vulgarity of style subject and conception as i am disgusted with the gilded side of the same meaning as displayed by some affected admirers with whom he is forsooth a sweet simple poet and so natural that little master charles and his younger sister are so charmed with them that they play at goody blake or at johnny and betty foy were the collection of poems published with these biographical sketches important enough which i am not vain enough to believe to deserve such a distinction even as i have done so would i be done unto for more than eighteen months have the volume of poems entitled sibylline leaves and the present volume up to this page been printed and ready for publication but ere i speak of myself in the tones which are alone natural to me under the circumstances of late years i would fain present myself to the reader as i was in the first dawn of my literary life when hope grew round me like the climbing vine and fruits and foliage not my own seem mine for this purpose i have selected from the letters which i wrote home from germany those which appeared likely to be most interesting and at the same time most pertinent to the title of this work End of chapter twenty two saturday letters letter one of biographia literaria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee biographia literaria by samuel taylor coleridge saturday's letters letter one on sunday morning september sixteenth seventeen ninety eight the hamburg packet set sail from yarmouth and i for the first time in my life beheld my native land retiring from me at the moment of its disappearance 
in all the kirks churches chapels and meeting-houses in which the greater number i hope of my countrymen were at that time assembled i will dare question whether there was one more ardent prayer offered up to heaven than that which i then preferred for my country now then said i to a gentleman who was standing near me we are out of our country not yet not yet he replied and pointed to the sea this too is a britain's country this bon mot gave a fillip to my spirits i rose and looked round on my fellow-passengers who were all on the deck we were eighteen in number vide lisette five englishmen an english lady a french gentleman and his servant an hanoverian and his servant a prussian a swede two danes and a mulatto boy a german tailor and his wife the smallest couple i ever beheld and a jew we were all on the deck but in a short time i observed marks of dismay the lady retired to the cabin in some confusion and many of the faces round me assumed a very doleful and frog-coloured appearance and within an hour the number of those on deck was lessened by one half i was giddy but not sick and the giddiness soon went away but left a feverishness and want of appetite which i attributed in great measure to the saiva mephitis of the bilge-water and it was certainly not decreased by the exportations from the cabin however i was well enough to join the able-bodied passengers one of whom observed not in aptly that momus might have discovered an easier way to see a man's inside than by placing a window in his breast he needed only have taken a salt-water trip in a packet-boat i am inclined to believe that a packet is far superior to a stage-coach as a means of making men open out to each other in the latter the uniformity of posture disposes to dozing and the definitiveness of the period at which the company will separate makes each individual think more of those to whom he is going than of those with whom he is going but at sea more curiosity is excited if only on this account that the pleasant or unpleasant qualities of your companions are of great importance to you from the uncertainty how long you may be obliged to house with them besides if you are countrymen that now begins to form a distinction and a bond of brotherhood and if of different countries there are new incitements of conversation more to ask and more to communicate i found that i had interested the danes in no common degree i had crept into the boat on the deck and fallen asleep but was awakened by one of them about three o'clock in the afternoon who told me that they had been seeking me in every hole and corner and insisted that i should join their party and drink with them he talked english with such fluency as left me wholly unable to account for the singular and even ludicrous incorrectness with which he spoke it i went and found some excellent wines and a dessert of grapes with a pineapple the danes had christened me dr theology and dressed as i was all in black with large shoes and black worsted stockings i might certainly have passed very well for a methodist missionary however i disclaim my title what then may you be a man of fortune no a merchant no a merchant's traveller no a clerk no a philosophe perhaps it was at that time in my life in which of all possible names and characters i had the greatest disgust to that of un philosophe but i was weary of being questioned and rather than be nothing or at best only the abstract idea of a man i submitted by a bow even to the aspersion implied in the word un philosophe the dane then informed me that all in the present party were philosophers likewise certes we were not of the stoic school for we drank and talked and sung till we talked and sung all together and then we rose and danced on the deck a set of dancers which in one sense of the word at least were very intelligibly and appropriately entitled reels the passengers who lay in the cabin below in all the agonies of sea-sickness must have found our bacchanalian merriment a tune harsh and of dissonant mood from their complaint i thought so at the time and by way i suppose of supporting my newly assumed philosophical character i thought too how closely the greater number of our virtues are connected with the fear of death and how little sympathy we bestow on pain where there is no danger the two danes were brothers the one was a man with a clear white complexion white hair and white eyebrows looked silly and nothing that he uttered gave the lie to his looks the other whom by way of eminence i have called the dane had likewise white hair but was much shorter than his brother with slender limbs and a very thin face slightly pock fretten this man convinced me of the justice of an old remark that many a faithful portrait in our novels and farces has been rashly censured for an outrageous caricature or perhaps nonentity i had retired to my station in the boat he came and seated himself by my side and appeared not a little tipsy he commenced the conversation in the most magnific style and as a sort of pioneering to his own vanity he flattered me with such grossness the parasites of the old comedy were modest in the comparison his language and accentuation were so exceedingly singular that i determined for once in my life to take notes of a conversation here it follows somewhat abridged indeed but in all other respects as accurately as my memory permitted the dane 
vat imagination vat language vat vast science and vat eyes vat a milk-white forehead oh my heaven why you're a got answer you do me too much honour sir the dane oh me if you should think i is flattering you no 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 i have ten thousand a year yes ten thousand a year yes ten thousand pound a year vell and vat is dat a mere trifle i wouldn't give my sincere heart for ten times de money yes you're a got i a mere man but my dear friend think of me as a man is is i mean to ask you now my dear friend is i not very eloquent is i not speak english very fine answer most admirably believe me sir i have seldom heard even a native talk so fluently the dane squeezing my hand with great vehemence my dear friend what an affection and fidelity we have for each other but tell me do tell me is i not now and then speak some fault is i not in some wrong answer why sir perhaps it might be observed by nice critics in the english language that you occasionally use the word is instead of am in our best companies we generally say i am and not i is or eyes excuse me sir it is a mere trifle the dane oh is is am 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 yes yes i know i know answer i am thou art he is we are ye are they are the dane yes yes i know i know am 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 is the presence and is is the perfectum yes yes and are is the plusquam perfectum answer and art sir is the dane my dear friend it is the plusquam perfectum no no that is a great lie are is the plusquam perfectum and art is the plasquam plu perfectum then swinging my hand to and fro and cocking his little bright hazel eyes at me that danced with vanity and wine you see my dear friend that i too have some learning answer learning sir who dare suspect it who can listen to you for a minute who can even look at you without perceiving the extent of it the dane my dear friend then with a would-be humble look and in a tone of voice as if he was reasoning i could not talk so of prawns and imperfectum and futurum and plusquam plu perfectum and all that my dear friend without some learning answer sir a man like you cannot talk on any subject without discovering the depth of his information the dane de grammatic greek my friend ha 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 laughing and swinging my hand to and fro then with a sudden transition to great solemnity now i will tell you my dear friend there did happen about me what the whole historia of denmark record no instance about nobody else the bishop did ask me all the questions about all the religion in the latin grammar answer the grammar sir the language i presume the dane a little offended grammar is language and language is grammar answer ten thousand pardons the dane well and i was only fourteen years answer only fourteen years old the dane no more i was fourteen years old and he asked me all questions religion and philosophy and all in the latin language and i answered him all every one my dear friend all in the latin language answer a prodigy an absolute prodigy the dane no 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 he was a bishop a great superintendent answer yes a bishop the dane a bishop not a mere predicant not a prediger answer my dear sir we have misunderstood each other i said that your answering in latin at so early an age was a prodigy that is a thing that is wonderful that does not often happen the dane often there is not one instance recorded in the whole historia of denmark answer and since then sir the dane i was sent over to the west indies to our island and there i had no more to do vid books no no i put my genius another way and i have made ten thousand pound a year is not dat genius my dear friend but vat is money i think the poorest man alive my equal yes my dear friend my little fortune is pleasant to my generous heart because i can do good no man with so little a fortune ever did so much generosity no person no man person no woman person ever denies it 
but we are all God's children. Here the Hanoverian interrupted him, and the other Dane, the Swede, and the Prussian joined us, together with a young Englishman who spoke the German fluently, and interpreted to me many of the Prussian's jokes. The Prussian was a travelling merchant, turned of three score, a hale man, tall, strong, and stout, full of stories, gesticulations, and buffoonery, with the soul as well as the look of a mountebank who, while he is making you laugh, picks your pocket. Amid all his droll looks and droll gestures, there remained one look untouched by laughter, and that one look was the true face, the others were but its mask. The Hanoverian was a pale, fat, bloated young man, whose father had made a large fortune in London as an army contractor. He seemed to emulate the manners of young Englishmen of fortune. He was a good-natured fellow, not without information or literature, but a most egregious coxcomb. He had been in the habit of attending the House of Commons, and had once spoken, as he informed me, with great applause in a debating society. For this he appeared to have qualified himself with laudable industry, for he was perfect in Walker's pronouncing dictionary, and with an accent which forcibly reminded me of the Scotchman in Roderick Random, who professed to teach the English pronunciation. He was constantly deferring to my superior judgment, whether or no I had pronounced this or that word with propriety, or the true delicacy. When he spoke, though it were only half a dozen sentences, he always rose, for which I could detect no other motive than his partiality to that elegant phrase so liberally introduced in the orations of our British legislators, while I am on my legs. The Swede, whom for reasons that will soon appear I shall distinguish by the name of nobility, was a strong-featured, scurvy-faced man, his complexion resembling in colour a red-hot poker beginning to cool. He appeared miserably dependent on the Dane, but was, however, incomparably the best informed and most rational of the party. Indeed, his manners and conversation discovered him to be both a man of the world and a gentleman. The Jew was in the hold. The French gentleman was lying on the deck so ill that I could observe nothing concerning him, except the affectionate attentions of his servant to him. The poor fellow was very sick himself, and every now and then ran to the side of the vessel, still keeping his eye on his master, but returned in a moment and seated himself again by him, now supporting his head, now wiping his forehead, and talking to him all the while in the most soothing tones. There had been a matrimonial squabble of a very ludicrous kind in the cabin, between the little German tailor and his little wife. He had secured two beds, one for himself and one for her. This had struck the little woman as a very cruel action. She insisted upon their having but one, and assured the mate in the most piteous tones that she was his lawful wife. The mate and the cabin boy decided in her favour, abused the little man for his want of tenderness with much humour, and hoisted him into the same compartment with his seasick wife. This quarrel was interesting to me, as it procured me a bed which I otherwise should not have had. In the evening, at seven o'clock, the sea rolled higher, and the Dane, by means of the greater agitation, eliminated enough of what he had been swallowing to make room for a great deal more. His favourite potation was sugar and brandy, i.e., a very little warm water with a large quantity of brandy, sugar, and nutmeg. His servant-boy, a black-eyed mulatto, had a good-natured round face, exactly the colour of the skin of the walnut colonel. The Dane and I were again seated tete-a-tete -tete in the ship's boat. The conversation, which was now indeed rather an oration than a dialogue, became extravagant beyond all that I ever heard. He told me that he had made a large fortune in the island of Santa Cruz, and was now returning to Denmark to enjoy it. He expatiated on the style in which he meant to live, and the great undertakings which he proposed to himself to commence, till the brandy aiding his vanity, and his vanity and garrulity aiding the brandy. He talked like a madman, and treated me to accompany him to Denmark. There I should see his influence with the government, and he would introduce me to the king, etc., etc. Thus he went on, dreaming aloud, and then, passing with a very lyrical transition to the subject of general politics, he declaimed, like a member of the corresponding society, about, not concerning, the rights of man, and assured me that, notwithstanding his fortune, he thought the poorest man alive his equal. "'All are equal, my dear friend, all are equal, we are all God's children. The poorest man hath the same rights with me. Jack, Jack, some more sugar and brandy. There is that fellow now. He is a mulatto, but he is my equal. That's right, Jack,' taking the sugar and brandy. "'Here, you, sir, shake hands with this gentleman. Shake hands with me, you dog. Dare, dare. We are all equal, my dear friend.' Do I not speak like Socrates, and Plato, and Cato? They were all philosophers, my dear philosophe, all very great men, and so was Homer and Virgil, but they were poets. Yes, yes, I know all about it, but what can anybody say more than this? We are all equal, all God's children, I have ten thousand a year, but I am no more than the meanest man alive. 
I have no pride, and yet, my dear friend, I can say do, and it is done. Ha, 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 my dear friend, now dares that gentleman, pointing to nobility, he is a Swedish baron, you shall see. Ho, oh, calling to the Swede, get me, will you, a bottle of wine from the cabin? Swede, here, Jack, go and get your master a bottle of wine from the cabin. Dane, no, 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 do you go now, you go yourself, you go now. Swede, Pah! Dane, now go, go, I pray you. And the Swede went. After this the Dane commenced an harangue on religion, and mistaking me for unphilosoph in the continental sense of the word, he talked of deity in a declamatory style, very much resembling the devotional rants of that rude blunderer Mr. Thomas Paine in his age of reason, and whispered in my ear what damned hypocrism all Jesus Christ's business was. I dare aver that few men have less reason to charge themselves with indulging in persiflage than myself, I should hate it if it were only that it is a Frenchman's vice, and feel a pride in avoiding it, because I own language is too honest to have a word to express it by. But in this instance the temptation had been too powerful, and I have placed it on the list of my offences. Pericles answered one of his dearest friends, who had solicited him on a case of life and death, to take an equivocal oath for his preservation. Debeo amicis opitulari sed usque ad deos. Friendship herself must place her last and boldest step on this side the altar. What Pericles would not do to save a friend's life, you may be assured, I would not hazard merely to mill the chocolate-pot of a drunken fool's vanity, till it frothed over. Assuming a serious look, I profess myself a believer, and sunk at once an hundred fathoms in his good graces. He retired to his cabin, and I wrapped myself up in my greatcoat and looked at the water. A beautiful white cloud of foam at momently intervals coursed by the side of the vessel with a roar, and little stars of flame danced and sparkled and went out in it and every now and then light detachments of this white cloud-like foam darted off from the vessel's side, each with its own small constellation, over the sea, and scoured out of sight, like a Tartar troop over a wilderness. It was cold, the cabin was at open war with my olfactories, and I found reason to rejoice in my greatcoat, a weighty, high-caped, respectable rug, the collar of which turned over and played the part of a nightcap very passably, in looking up at two or three bright stars which oscillated with the motion of the sails. I fell asleep, but was awakened at one o'clock Monday morning, by a shower of rain. I found myself compelled to go down into the cabin, where I slept very soundly, and awoke with a very good appetite at breakfast-time, my nostrils, the most placable of all the senses, reconciled to, or indeed insensible, of the mephitis. Monday, September 17th, I had a long conversation with the Swede, who spoke with the most poignant contempt of the Dane, whom he described as a fool, purse-mad but he confirmed the boast of the Dane respecting the largeness of his fortune, which he had acquired in the first instance as an advocate, and afterwards as a planter. From the Dane and from himself I collected that he was indeed a Swedish nobleman, who had squandered a fortune that was never very large, and had made over his property to the Dane, on whom he was now utterly dependent. He seemed to suffer very little pain from the Dane's insolence. He was in a high degree humane and attentive to the English lady, who suffered most fearfully, and for whom he performed many little offices, with a tenderness and delicacy which seemed to prove real goodness of heart. Indeed, his general manners and conversation were not only pleasing, but even interesting, and I struggled to believe his insensibility respecting the Dane, philosophical fortitude. For though the Dane was now quite sober, his character oozed out of him at every pore, and after dinner, when he was again flushed with wine, every quarter of an hour, perhaps oftener, he would shout out to the Swede, "'Ho, oh, nobility, go, do such a thing, Mr. Nobility, tell the gentleman such a story, and so forth.' with an insolence which must have excited disgust and detestation, if his vulgar rants on the sacred rights of equality, joined to his wild havoc of general grammar, no less than of the English language, had not rendered it so irresistibly laughable. At four o'clock I observed a wild duck swimming on the waves, a single solitary wild duck. It is not easy to conceive how interesting a thing it looked in that round, objectless desert of waters. I had associated such a feeling of immensity with the ocean, that I felt exceedingly disappointed, when I was out of sight of all land, at the narrowness and nearness, as it were, of the circle of the horizon. So little are images capable of satisfying the obscure feelings connected with words. In the evening the sails were lowered, lest we should run foul of the land, which can be seen only at a small distance. And at four o'clock on Tuesday morning I was awakened by the cry of land, land. It was an ugly island rock at a distance on our left, called Heligoland, well known to many passengers from Yarmouth to Hamburg who have been obliged by stormy weather to pass weeks and weeks in weary captivity on it, stripped of all their money by the exorbitant demands of the wretches who inhabit it. 
so at least the sailors inform me about nine o'clock we saw the mainland which seemed scarcely able to hold its head above water low flat and dreary with lighthouses and landmarks which seemed to give a character and language to the dreariness we entered the mouth of the elba passing neuwerk though as yet the right bank only of the river was visible to us on this i saw a church and thanked god for my safe voyage not without affectionate thoughts of those i had left in england at eleven o'clock on the same morning we arrived at cuxhaven the ship dropped anchor and the boat was hoisted out to carry the hanoverian and a few others on shore the captain agreed to take us who remained to hamburg for ten guineas to which the dane contributed so largely that the other passengers paid but half a guinea each accordingly we hauled anchor and passed gently up the river at cuxhaven both sides of the river may be seen in clear weather we could now see the right bank only we passed a multitude of english traders that had been waiting many weeks for a wind in a short time both banks became visible both flat and evidencing the labour of human hands by their extreme neatness on the left bank i saw a church or two in the distance on the right bank we passed by steeple and windmill and cottage and windmill and single house windmill and windmill and neat single house and steeple these were the objects and in the succession the shores were very green and planted with trees not inelegantly thirty-five miles from cuxhaven the night came on us and as the navigation of the elba is perilous we dropped anchor over what place thought i does the moon hang to your eye my dearest friend to me it hung over the left bank of the elba close above the moon was a huge volume of deep black cloud while a very thin fillet crossed the middle of the orb as narrow and thin and black as a ribbon of crape the long trembling road of moonlight which lay on the water and reached to the stern of our vessel glimmered dimly and obscurely we saw two or three lights from the right bank probably from bedrooms i felt the striking contrast between the silence of this majestic stream whose banks are populous with men and women and children and flocks and herds between the silence by night of this peopled river and the ceaseless noise and uproar and loud agitations of the desolate solitude of the ocean the passengers below had all retired to their beds and i felt the interest of this quiet scene the more deeply from the circumstance of having just quitted them for the prussian had during the whole of the evening displayed all his talents to captivate the dane who had admitted him into the train of his dependents the young englishman continued to interpret the prussian's jokes to me they were all without exception profane and abominable but some sufficiently witty and a few incidents which he related in his own person were valuable as illustrating the manners of the countries in which they had taken place five o'clock on wednesday morning we hauled the anchor but were soon obliged to drop it again in consequence of the thick fog which our captain feared would continue the whole day but about nine it cleared off and we sailed slowly along close by the shore of a very beautiful island forty miles from cuxhaven the wind continuing slack this holm or island is about a mile and a half in length wedge-shaped well wooded with glades of the liveliest green and rendered more interesting by the remarkably neat farmhouse on it it seemed made for retirement without solitude a place that would allure one's friends while it precluded the impertinent calls of mere visitors the shores of the elba now became more beautiful with rich meadows and trees running like a low wall along the river's edge and peering over them neat houses and especially on the right bank a profusion of steeple spires white black or red an instinctive taste teaches men to build their churches in flat countries with spire steeples which as they cannot be referred to any other object point as with silent finger to the sky and stars and sometimes when they reflect the brazen light of a rich though rainy sunset appear like a pyramid of flame burning heavenward i remember once and once only to have seen a spire in a narrow valley of a mountainous country the effect was not only mean but ludicrous and reminded me against my will of an extinguisher the close neighbourhood of the high mountain at the foot of which it stood had so completely dwarfed it and deprived it of all connection with the sky or clouds forty-six english miles from cuxhaven and sixteen from hamburg the danish village vader ornaments the left bank with its black steeple and close by it is the wild and pastoral hamlet of schulau hitherto both the right and left bank green to the very brink and level with the river resemble the shores of a park canal the trees and houses were alike low sometimes the low trees overtopping the yet lower houses sometimes the low houses rising above the yet lower trees but at schulau the left bank rises at once forty or fifty feet and stares on the river with its perpendicular facade of sand thinly patched with tufts of green the elba continued to present a more and more lively spectacle from the multitude of fishing-boats and the flocks of seagulls wheeling round them 
the clamorous rivals and companions of the fishermen till we came to blancaness a most interesting village scattered amid scattered trees over three hills in three divisions each of the three hills stares upon the river with faces of bare sand with which the boats with their bare poles standing in files along the banks made a sort of fantastic harmony between each facade lies a green and woody dell each deeper than the other in short it is a large village made up of individual cottages each cottage in the centre of its own little wood or orchard and each with its own separate path a village with a labyrinth of paths or rather a neighbourhood of houses it is inhabited by fishermen and boat-makers the blankenese boats being in great request through the whole navigation of the elbe here first we saw the spires of hamburg and from hence as far as altona the left bank of the elbe is uncommonly pleasing considered as the vicinity of an industrious and republican city in that style of beauty or rather prettiness that might tempt the citizen into the country and yet gratify the taste which he had acquired in the town summer-houses and chinese show-work are everywhere scattered along the high and green banks the boards of the farmhouses left unplastered and gaily painted with green and yellow and scarcely a tree not cut into shapes and made to remind the human being of his own power and intelligence instead of the wisdom of nature still however these are links of connection between town and country and far better than the affectation of tastes and enjoyments for which men's habits have disqualified them passing by on saturdays and sundays with the burghers of hamburg smoking their pipes the women and children feasting in the alcoves of box and yew and it becomes a nature of its own on wednesday four o'clock we left the vessel and passing with trouble through the huge masses of shipping that seemed to choke the wide elbe from altona upward we were at length landed at the boom house hamburg End of letter one. Saturain's letters, letter two, of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Saturain's letters, letter two. To a lady, Ratzeburg. Meine liebe Freundin see how natural the german comes for me though i have not yet been six weeks in the country almost as fluently as english from my neighbour the amtschreiber or public secretary who as often as we meet though it should be half a dozen times in the same day never fails to greet me with damn your plut und eyes my dearest englander wie goes it which is certainly a proof of great generosity on his part these words being his whole stock of english i had however a better reason than the desire of displaying my proficiency for i wish to put you in good humour with a language from the acquirement of which i have promised myself much edification and the means too of communicating a new pleasure to you and your sister during our winter readings and how can i do this better than by pointing out its gallant attention to the ladies our english affix s is i believe confined either to words derived from the latin as actress directress etc or from the french as mistress duchess and the like but the german in enables us to designate the sex in every possible relation of life thus the amtmann's lady is the frau amtmannin the secretary's wife by the by the handsomest woman i have yet seen in germany is die allerliebste frau amtschreiberin the colonel's lady die frau obristin or Connellin, and even the parson's wife die frau pastorin but i am especially pleased with their freundin which unlike the amica of the romans is seldom used but in its best and purest sense now i know it will be said that a friend is already something more than a friend when a man feels an anxiety to express to himself that this friend is a female but this i deny in that sense at least in which the objection will be made i would hazard the impeachment of heresy rather than abandon my belief that there is a sex in our souls as well as in their perishable garments and he who does not feel it never truly loved a sister nay is not capable even of loving a wife as she deserves to be loved if she indeed be worthy of that holy name now i know my gentle friend what you are murmuring to yourself this is so like him running away after the first bubble that chance has blown off from the surface of his fancy when one is anxious to learn where he is and what he has seen well then that i am settled at ratzeburg with my motives and the particulars of my journey hither will inform you my first letter to him with which doubtless he has edified your whole fireside left me safely landed at hamburg on the elbe stairs at the boom house while standing on the stairs i was amused by the contents of the passage-boat which crosses the river once or twice a day from hamburg to harburg it was stowed close with all people of all nations in all sorts of dresses the men all with pipes in their mouths and these pipes of all shapes and fancies straight and wreathed simple and complex long and short cane clay porcelain wood tin silver and ivory 
most of them with silver chains and silver bowl covers pipes and boots are the first universal characteristic of the male hamburgers that would strike the eye of a raw traveller but i forget my promise of journalising as much as possible therefore september nineteenth afternoon my companion who you recollect speaks the french language with unusual propriety had formed a kind of confidential acquaintance with the emigrant who appeared to be a man of sense and whose manners were those of a perfect gentleman he seemed about fifty or rather more whatever is unpleasant in french manners from excess in the degree had been softened down by age or affliction and all that is delightful in the kind alacrity and delicacy in little attentions etc remained and without bustle gesticulation or disproportionate eagerness his demeanour exhibited the minute philanthropy of a polished frenchman tempered by the sobriety of the english character disunited from its reserve there is something strangely attractive in the character of a gentleman when you apply the word emphatically and yet in that sense of the term which it is more easy to feel than to define it neither includes the possession of high moral excellence nor of necessity even the ornamental graces of manner i have now in my mind's eye a person whose life would scarcely stand scrutiny even in the court of honour much less in that of conscience and his manners if nicely observed would of the two excite an idea of awkwardness rather than of elegance and yet every one who conversed with him felt and acknowledged the gentleman the secret of the matter i believe to be this we feel the gentlemanly character present to us whenever under all the circumstances of social intercourse the trivial not less than the important through the whole detail of his manners and deportment and with the ease of a habit a person shows respect to others in such a way as at the same time implies in his own feelings an habitual and assured anticipation of reciprocal respect from them to himself in short the gentlemanly character arises out of the feeling of equality acting as a habit yet flexible to the varieties of rank and modified without being disturbed or superseded by them this description will perhaps explain to you the ground of one of your own remarks as i was englishing to you the interesting dialogue concerning the causes of the corruption of eloquence what perfect gentlemen these old romans must have been i was impressed i remember with the same feeling at the time i was reading a translation of cicero's philosophical dialogues and of his epistolary correspondence while in pliny's letters i seemed to have a different feeling he gave me the notion of a very fine gentleman you uttered the words as if you had felt that the adjunct had injured the substance and the increased degree altered the kind pliny was the courtier of an absolute monarch cicero an aristocratic republican for this reason the character of gentleman in the sense to which i have confined it is frequent in england rare in france and found where it is found in age or the latest period of manhood while in germany the character is almost unknown but the proper antipathy of a gentleman is to be sought for among the anglo-american democrats i owe this digression as an act of justice to this amiable frenchman and of humiliation for myself for in a little controversy between us on the subject of french poetry he made me feel my own ill behaviour by the silent reproof of contrast and when i afterwards apologised to him for the warmth of my language he answered me with a cheerful expression of surprise and an immediate compliment which a gentleman might both make with dignity and receive with pleasure i was pleased therefore to find it agreed on that we should if possible take up our quarters in the same house my friend went with him in search of an hotel and i to deliver my letters of recommendation i walked onward at a brisk pace enlivened not so much by anything i actually saw as by the confused sense that i was for the first time in my life on the continent of our planet i seemed to myself like a liberated bird that had been hatched in an aviary who now after his first soar of freedom poises himself in the upper air very naturally i began to wonder at all things some for being so like and some for being so unlike the things in england dutch women with large umbrella hats shooting out half a yard before them with a prodigal plumpness of petticoat behind the women of hamburg with caps plaited on the call with silver or gold or both bordered round with stiffened lace which stood out before their eyes but not lower so that the eyes sparkled through it the hanoverian with the fore part of the head bare then a stiff lace standing up like a wall perpendicular on the cap and the cap behind tailed with an enormous quantity of ribbon which lies or tosses on the back their visnomies seemed like a goodly banner spread in defiance of all enemies the ladies all in english dresses all rouged and all with bad teeth which you notice instantly from their contrast to the almost animal too glossy mother-of-pearl whiteness and the regularity of the teeth of the laughing loud-talking countrywomen and servant girls who with their clean white stockings and with slippers without heel quarters tripped along the dirty streets as if they were secured by a charm from the dirt with a lightness too which surprised me who had always considered it as one of the annoyances of sleeping in an inn that i had to clatter upstairs in a pair of them the streets narrow 
to my english nose sufficiently offensive and explaining at first sight the universal use of boots without any appropriate path for the foot passengers the gable ends of the houses all towards the street some in the ordinary triangular form and entire as the botanists say but the greater number notched and scalloped with more than chinese grotesqueness above all i was struck with the profusion of windows so large and so many that the houses look all glass mr pitt's window-tax with its pretty little additional sprouting out from it like young toadlets on the back of a surinam toad would certainly improve the appearance of the hamburg houses which have a slight summer look not in keeping with their size incongruous with the climate and precluding that feeling of retirement and self-content which one wishes to associate with a house in a noisy city but a conflagration would i fear be the previous requisite to the production of any architectural beauty in hamburg for verily it is a filthy town i moved on and crossed a multitude of ugly bridges with huge black deformities of water-wheels close by them the water intersects the city everywhere and would have furnished to the genius of italy the capabilities of all that is most beautiful and magnificent in architecture it might have been the rival of venice and it is huddle and ugliness stench and stagnation the jungferstieg that is young ladies walk to which my letters directed me made an exception it was a walk or promenade planted with treble rows of elm trees which being yearly pruned and cropped remained slim and dwarf-like this walk occupies one side of a square piece of water with many swans on it perfectly tame and moving among the swans shoey pleasure-boats with ladies in them rowed by their husbands or lovers some paragraphs have been here omitted thus embarrassed by sad and solemn politeness still more than by broken english it sounded like the voice of an old friend when i heard the emigrant servant inquiring after me he had come for the purpose of guiding me to our hotel through streets and streets i pressed on as happy as a child and i doubt not with a childish expression of wonderment in my busy eyes amused by the wicker wagons with movable benches across them one behind the other these were the hackney coaches amused by the signboards of the shops on which all the articles sold within are painted and that too very exactly though in a grotesque confusion a useful substitute for language in this great mart of nations amused with the incessant tinkling of the shop and house-door bells the bell hanging over each door and struck with a small iron rod at every entrance and exit and finally amused by looking in at the windows as i passed along the ladies and gentlemen drinking coffee or playing cards and the gentlemen all smoking i wished myself a painter that i might have sent you a sketch of one of the card parties the long pipe of one gentleman rested on the table its bowl half a yard from his mouth fuming like a censer by the fish-pool the other gentleman who was dealing the cards and of course had both hands employed held his pipe in his teeth which hanging down between his knees smoked beside his ankles hogarth himself never drew a more ludicrous distortion both of attitude and physiognomy than this effort occasioned nor was there wanting beside it one of those beautiful female faces which the same hogarth in whom the satirist never extinguished that love of beauty which belonged to him as a poet so often and so gladly introduces as the central figure in a crowd of humorous deformities which figures such is the power of true genius neither acts nor is meant to act as a contrast but diffuses through all and over each of the group a spirit of reconciliation and human kindness and even when the attention is no longer consciously directed to the cause of this feeling still blends its tenderness with our laughter and thus prevents the instructive merriment at the whims of nature or the foibles or humours of our fellow-men from degenerating into the heart poison of contempt or hatred our hotel de wildermann the sign of which was no bad likeness of the landlord who had engrafted on a very grim face a restless grin that was at every man's service and which indeed like an actor rehearsing to himself he kept playing in expectation of an occasion for it neither our hotel i say nor its landlord were of the genteelest class but it has one great advantage for a stranger by being in the market-place and the next neighbour of the huge church of st nicholas a church with shops and houses built up against it out of which wens and warts its high massy steeple rises necklace near the top with a round of large gilt balls a better pole-star could scarcely be desired long shall i retain the impression made on my mind by the awful echo so loud and long and tremulous of the deep-toned clock within this church which awoke me at two in the morning from a distressful dream occasioned i believe by the feather-bed which is used here instead of bedclothes i will rather carry my blanket about with me like a wild indian than submit to this abominable custom our emigrant acquaintance was we found an intimate friend of the celebrated abbe de lille and from the large fortune which he possessed under the monarchy had rescued sufficient not only for independence but for respectability he had offended some of his fellow-emigrants in london whom he had obliged with considerable sums 
by a refusal to make further advances and in consequence of their intrigues had received an order to quit the kingdom i thought it one proof of his innocence that he attached no blame either to the alien act or to the minister who had exerted it against him and a still greater that he spoke of london with rapture and of his favourite niece who had married and settled in england with all the fervour and all the pride of a fond parent a man sent by force out of a country obliged to sell out of the stocks at a great loss and exiled from those pleasures and that style of society which habit had rendered essential to his happiness whose predominant feelings were yet all of a private nature resentment for friendship outraged and anguish for domestic affections interrupted such a man i think i could dare warrant guiltless of espionage in any service most of all in that of the present french directory he spoke with ecstasy of paris under the monarchy and yet the particular facts which made up his description left as deep a conviction on my mind of french worthlessness as his own tale had done of emigrant ingratitude since my arrival in germany i have not met a single person even among those who abhor the revolution that spoke with favour or even charity of the french emigrants though the belief of their influence in the organization of this disastrous war from the horrors of which north germany deems itself only reprieved not secured may have some share in the general aversion with which they are regarded yet i am deeply persuaded that the far greater part is owing to their own profligacy to their treachery and hard-heartedness to each other and the domestic misery or corrupt principles which so many of them have carried into the families of their protectors my heart dilated with honest pride as i recall to mind the stern yet amiable characters of the english patriots who sought refuge on the continent at the restoration oh let not our civil war under the first charles be paralleled with the french revolution in the former the character overflowed from excess of principle in the latter from the fermentation of the dregs the former was a civil war between the virtues and virtuous prejudices of the two parties the latter between the vices the venetian glass of the french monarchy shivered and flew asunder with the working of a double poison september twentieth i was introduced to mr klopstock the brother of the poet who again introduced me to professor eberling an intelligent and lively man though deaf so deaf indeed that it was a painful effort to talk with him as we were obliged to drop our pearls into a huge ear-trumpet from this courteous and kind-hearted man of letters i hope the german literati in general may resemble this first specimen i heard a tolerable italian pun and an interesting anecdote when bonaparte was in italy having been irritated by some instance of perfidy he said in a loud and vehement tone in a public company tis a true proverb gli italiani tutti ladroni and that is the italians all plunderers a lady had the courage to reply non tutti ma buona parte not all but a good part or bonaparte this i confess sounded to my ears as one of the many good things that might have been said the anecdote is more valuable for it instances the ways and means of french insinuation hoche had received much information concerning the face of the country from a map of unusual fullness and accuracy the maker of which he heard resided at dusseldorf at the storming of dusseldorf by the french army hoche previously ordered that the house and property of this man should be preserved and entrusted the performance of the order to an officer on whose troop he could rely finding afterwards that the man had escaped before the storming commenced hoche exclaimed he had no reason to flee it is for such men not against them that the french nation makes war and consents to shed the blood of its children you remember milton's sonnet the great emathian conqueror bid spare the house of pindarus when temple and tower went to the ground now though the dusseldorf map-maker may stand in the same relation to the theban bard as the snail that marks its path by lines of film on the wall it creeps over to the eagle that soars sunward and beats the tempest with its wings it does not therefore follow that the jacobin of france may not be as valiant a general and as good a politician as the madman of macedon from professor Eberling's, mr klopstock accompanied my friend and me to his own house where i saw a fine bust of his brother there was a solemn and heavy greatness in his countenance which corresponded to my preconceptions of his style and genius i saw there likewise a very fine portrait of lessing whose works are at present the chief object of my admiration his eyes were uncommonly like mine if anything rather larger and more prominent but the lower part of his face and his nose oh what an exquisite expression of elegance and sensibility there appeared no depth weight or comprehensiveness in the forehead the whole face seemed to say that lessing was a man of quick and voluptuous feelings of an active but light fancy acute yet acute not in the observation of actual life but in the arrangements and management of the ideal world that is in taste and in metaphysics i assure you that i wrote these very words in my memorandum-book with the portrait before my eyes and when i knew nothing of lessing but his name 
and that he was a german writer of eminence we consumed two hours and more over a bad dinner at the table dot patience at a german ordinary smiling at time the germans are the worst cooks in europe there is place for every two persons a bottle of common wine rhenish and claret alternately but in the houses of the opulent during the many and long intervals of the dinner the servants hand round glasses of richer wines at the lord of culpin's they came in this order burgundy madeira port frontiniac pacchiaretti old hock mountain champagne hock again bishop and lastly punch a tolerable quantum methinks the last dish at the ornery viz slices of roast pork for all the larger dishes are brought in cut up and first handed round and then set on the table with stewed prunes and other sweet fruits and this followed by cheese and butter with plates of apples reminded me of shakespeare and shakespeare put it in my head to go to the french comedy bless me why it is worse than our modern english plays the first act informed me that a court-martial is to be held on a count vatron who had drawn his sword on the colonel his brother-in-law the officers plead in his behalf in vain his wife the colonel's sister pleads with most tempestuous agonies in vain she falls into hysterics and faints away to the dropping of the inner curtain in the second act sentence of death is passed on the count his wife as frantic and hysterical as before more so good industrious creature as she could not be the third and last act the wife still frantic very frantic indeed the soldiers just about to fire the handkerchief actually dropped when reprieve reprieve is heard from behind the scenes and in comes prince somebody pardons the count and the wife is still frantic only with joy that was all oh dear lady this is one of the cases in which laughter is followed by melancholy for such is the kind of drama which is now substituted everywhere for shakespeare and racine you well know that i offer violence to my own feelings in joining these names but however meanly i may think of the french serious drama even in its most perfect specimens and with whatever right i may complain of its perpetual falsification of the language and of the connections and transitions of thought which nature has appropriated to states of passion still however the french tragedies are consistent works of art and the offspring of great intellectual power preserving a fitness in the parts and a harmony in the whole they form a nature of their own though a false nature still they excite the minds of the spectators to active thought to a striving after ideal excellence the soul is not stupefied into mere sensations by worthless sympathy with our own ordinary sufferings or an empty curiosity for the surprising undignified by the language or the situations which awe and delight the imagination what i would ask of the crowd that press forward to the pantomimic tragedies and weeping comedies of kotzebue and his imitators what are you seeking is it comedy but in the comedy of shakespeare and moliere the more accurate my knowledge and the more profoundly i think the greater is the satisfaction that mingles with my laughter for though the qualities which these writers portray are ludicrous indeed either from the kind or the excess and exquisitely ludicrous yet are they the natural growth of the human mind and such as with more or less change in the drapery i can apply to my own heart or at least to whole classes of my fellow-creatures how often are not the moralist and the metaphysician obliged for the happiest illustrations of general truths and the subordinate laws of human thought and action to quotations not only from the tragic characters but equally from the jakes falstaff and even from the fools and clowns of shakespeare or from the miser hypochondriast and hypocrite of moliere say not that i am recommending abstractions for these class characteristics which constitute the instructiveness of a character are so modified and particularized in each person of the shakespearean drama that life itself does not excite more distinctly that sense of individuality which belongs to real existence paradoxical as it may sound one of the essential properties of geometry is not less essential to dramatic excellence and if i may mention his name without pedantry to a lady aristotle has accordingly required of the poet an involution of the universal in the individual the chief differences are that in geometry it is the universal truth itself which is uppermost in the consciousness in poetry the individual form in which the truth is clothed with the ancients and not less with the elder dramatists of england and france both comedy and tragedy were considered as kinds of poetry they neither sought in comedy to make us laugh merely much less to make us laugh by wry faces accidents of jargon slang phrases for the day or the clothing of commonplace morals in metaphors drawn from the shops or mechanic occupations of their characters nor did they condescend in tragedy to wheedle away the applause of the spectators by representing before them facsimiles of their own mean selves in all their existing meanness or to work on their sluggish sympathies by a pathos not a whit more respectable than the maudlin tears of drunkenness their tragic scenes were meant to affect us indeed but within the bounds of pleasure and in union with the activity both of our understanding and imagination 
they wish to transport the mind to a sense of its possible greatness and to implant the germs of that greatness during the temporary oblivion of the worthless thing we are and of the peculiar state in which each man happens to be suspending our individual recollections and lulling them to sleep amid the music of nobler thought hold methinks i hear the spokesman of the crowd reply and we will listen to him i am the plaintiff and he the defendant defendant hold are not our modern sentimental plays filled with the best christian morality plaintiff yes just as much of it and just that part of it which you can exercise without a single christian virtue without a single sacrifice that is really painful to you just as much as flatters you sends you away pleased with your own hearts and quite reconciled to your vices which can never be thought very ill of when they keep such good company and walk hand in hand with so much compassion and generosity adulation so loathsome that you would spit in the man's face who dared offer it to you in a private company unless you interpreted it as insulting irony you appropriate with infinite satisfaction when you share the garbage with a whole sty and gobble it out of a common trough no caesar must pace your boards no antony no royal dane no orestes no andromache d no or as few of them as possible what has a plain citizen of london or hamburg to do with your kings and queens and your old schoolboy pagan heroes besides everybody knows the stories and what curiosity can we feel p what sir not for the manner not for the delightful language of the poet not for the situations the action and reaction of the passions d you are hasty sir the only curiosity we feel is in the story and how can we be anxious concerning the end of a play or be surprised by it when we know how it will turn out p your pardon for having interrupted you we now understand each other you seek then in a tragedy which wise men of old held for the highest effort of human genius the same gratification as that you receive from a new novel the last german romance and other dainties of the day which can be enjoyed but once if you carry these feelings to the sister art of painting michelangelo's sistine chapel and the scripture gallery of raphael can expect no favour from you you know all about them beforehand and are doubtless more familiar with the subjects of those paintings than with the tragic tales of the historic or heroic ages there is a consistency therefore in your preference of contemporary writers for the great men of former times those at least who are deemed great by our ancestors sought so little to gratify this kind of curiosity that they seem to have regarded the story in a not much higher light than the painter regards his canvas as that on not by which they were to display their appropriate excellence no work resembling a tale or romance can well show less variety of invention in the incidents or less anxiety in weaving them together than the don quixote of cervantes its admirers feel the disposition to go back and reperuse some preceding chapter at least ten times for once that they find any eagerness to hurry forwards or open the book on those parts which they best recollect even as we visit those friends oftenest whom we loved most and with whose characters and actions we are the most intimately acquainted in the divine ariosto as his countrymen call this their darling poet i question whether there be a single tale of his own invention or the elements of which were not familiar to the readers of old romance i will pass by the ancient greeks who thought it even necessary to the fable of a tragedy and that its substance should be previously known that there had been at least fifty tragedies with the same title would be one of the motives which determined sophocles and euripides in the choice of electra as a subject but milton d ay milton indeed but do not dr johnson and other great men tell us that nobody now reads milton but as a task p so much the worse for them of whom this can be truly said but why then do you pretend to admire shakespeare the greater part if not all of his dramas were as far as the names and the main instants are concerned already stock plays all the stories at least on which they are built pre-existed in the chronicles ballads or translations of contemporary or preceding english writers why i repeat do you pretend to admire shakespeare is it perhaps that you only pretend to admire him however as one for all you have dismissed the well-known events and personages of history or the epic muse what have you taken in their stead whom has your tragic muse armed with her bowl and dagger the sentimental muse i should have said whom you have seated in the throne of tragedy what heroes has she reared on her buskins d oh our good friends and next-door neighbours honest tradesmen valiant tars high-spirited half-pay officers philanthropic jews virtuous courtesans tender-hearted braziers and sentimental rat-catchers a little bluff or so but all our very generous tender-hearted characters are a little rude or misanthropic and all our misanthropes very tender-hearted p but i pray you friend in what actions great or interesting can such men be engaged d they give away a great deal of money find rich dowries for young men and maidens who have all other good qualities they browbeat lords baronets and justices of the peace for they are as bold as hector 
they rescue stage-coaches at the instant they are falling down precipices carry away infants in the sight of opposing armies and some of our performers act a muscular able-bodied man to such perfection that our dramatic poets who always have the actors in their eye seldom fail to make their favourite male character as strong as samson and then they take such prodigious leaps and what is done on the stage is more striking even than what is acted i once remember such a deafening explosion that i could not hear a word of the play for half an act after it and a little real gunpowder being set fire to at the same time and smelt by all the spectators the naturalness of the scene was quite astonishing p but how can you connect with such men and such actions that dependence of thousands on the fate of one which gives so lofty an interest to the personages of shakespeare and the greek tragedians how can you connect with them that sublimest of all feelings the power of destiny and the controlling might of heaven which seems to elevate the characters which sink beneath its irresistible blow d oh mere fancies we seek and find on the present stage our own wants and passions our own vexations losses and embarrassments p it is your own poor pettifogging nature then which you desire to have represented before you not human nature in its height and vigour but surely you might find the former with all its joys and sorrows more conveniently in your own houses and parishes d true but here comes a difference fortune is blind but the poet has his eyes open and is besides as complaisant as fortune is capricious he makes everything turn out exactly as we would wish it he gratifies us by representing those as hateful or contemptible whom we hate and wish to despise p aside that is he gratifies your envy by libelling your superiors d he makes all those precise moralists who affect to be better than their neighbours turn out at last abject hypocrites traitors and hard-hearted villains and your men of spirit who take their girl in their glass with equal freedom prove the true men of honour and that no part of the audience may remain unsatisfied reform in the last scene and leave no doubt in the minds of the ladies that they will make most faithful and excellent husbands though it does seem a pity that they should be obliged to get rid of qualities which had made them so interesting besides the poor become rich all at once and in the final matrimonial choice the opulent and high-born themselves are made to confess that virtue is the only true nobility and that a lovely woman is a dowry of herself p excellent but you have forgotten those brilliant flashes of loyalty those patriotic praises of the king and old england which especially if conveyed in a metaphor from the ship or the shop so often solicit and so unfailingly receive the public plaudit i give your prudence credit for the omission for the whole system of your drama is a moral and intellectual jacobinism of the most dangerous kind and those commonplace rants of loyalty are no better than hypocrisy in your playwrights and your own sympathy with them a gross self-delusion for the whole secret of dramatic popularity consists with you in the confusion and subversion of the natural order of things their causes and their effects in the excitement of surprise by representing the qualities of liberality refined feeling and a nice sense of honour those things rather which pass among you for such in persons and in classes of life where experience teaches us least to expect them and in rewarding with all the sympathies that are the dues of virtue those criminals whom law reason and religion have excommunicated from our esteem and now good-night truly i might have written this last sheet without having gone to germany but i fancied myself talking to you by your own fireside and can you think it a small pleasure to me to forget now and then that i am not there besides you and my other good friends have made up your minds to me as i am and from whatever place i write you will expect that part of my travels will consist of excursions in my own mind end of saturain's letters letter two